we are back for overanalyzing House of the Dragon with part 24 of why Rhaenyra's Blacks faced off against Aegon's Greens. Forces have been working against Rhaenys, Rhaenyra, and Daemon, creating two parties, the Blacks and the Greens. The tensions between them supposedly causing this Year of the Red Spring. Lena died, Laenor died, Aemon lost an eye, and then Harwin and Lionel died. But after four funerals, we now have a wedding. Yet hardly had Sir Otto arrived at the Red Keep to take up the handship, than word reached court that Princess Rhaenyra had remarried, taking to husband her uncle, Daemon Targaryen. The princess was 23, Prince Daemon 39. King, court, and commons were all outraged by the news. Neither Daemon's wife nor Rhaenyra's husband had been dead even half a year. To wed again so soon was an insult to their memories, his grace declared angrily. The marriage had been performed on Dragonstone, suddenly and secretly. Septon Eustace claims that Rhaenyra knew her father would never approve of the match, so she wed in haste to make certain he could not prevent the marriage. Mushroom puts forward a different reason. The princess was once again with child and did not wish to birth the bastard. And so next we hear about the sudden marriage of Daemon and Rhaenyra. Now this marriage is to be expected. Damon wanted to marry Rhaenyra years ago and has consistently been interested in having dragon-riding children. And in return, Rhaenyra gets a dragon to help secure her claim, a father for more dragon-riding children, and perhaps some legitimacy to her claim with Damon being a Targaryen. The big shock with the wedding is the speed. Viserys is angry that the hasty marriage was an insult to the memory of Lena and Laenor. Eustace then thinks that the marriage happened hastily because Viserys would not have approved of the match, and Mushroom claims the marriage happened quickly because Rhaenyra was pregnant. Now, it's rather clear that Eustace is simply wrong here. We were told exactly why Viserys was against Daemon marrying Rhaenyra before. Daemon was already married to Rhea Royce. Now, this is no longer the case. It's getting married quickly that Viserys disapproves of, not the marriage itself. Mushroom, on the other hand, is almost certainly correct, for once. Damon and Rhaenyra get married inappropriately close to the deaths of their former spouses. It's undeniable. Not only does this anger Viserys, but it likely angers Corlys and Rhaenys even more. And they are important allies. There really seems to be no other good reason to be married so quickly. Yes, perhaps they wanted to get Rhaenyra married prior to Viserys betrothing her again, but they are many months ahead of that. They had every reason to wait at least a couple more months, but chose not to. And the most logical reason is that Rhaenyra is pregnant and that this is a shotgun wedding, so to speak. So with the year 120, the year of the Red Spring, we can piece together the timeline of events fairly well. We know that Aegon III is born near the end of the year, which places his conception date around the beginning of April, at least for a regular full-term baby. But of course, not all babies are regular. Some are born early, others born late so there is a range of when the child could have been conceived. And although it's Mushroom that puts forward that Rhaenyra was already pregnant when she and Daemon wed, we do not hear of the rest of the court jumping to this conclusion, or Gildane stating it as fact. Figuring out a baby's general conception date is not exactly rocket science, so it must be generally believable that the marriage happened before the conception. That is, a wedding sometime in April. And the ranges of when the two events could have happened cross over, making it impossible for anyone to know with certainty if Rhaenyra was truly pregnant. However, a wedding in April does mean all the rest of the events, the death of Lena, the death of Laenor, the loss of Aemon's eye, the death of Lionel and Harwin, Otto coming to King's Landing, all happened between January and March. Now, as I said, there is a range on when the child could have been conceived. The baby was small. It's possible that Aegon III was a little premature, making the conception date actually late April, but allowing Mushroom to spread a rumor that it wasn't premature. Or Rhaenyra simply told everyone the child was premature and she was really pregnant prior to the wedding. We simply don't have enough information to determine 100% if Rhaenyra was having sex prior to the wedding, but why else have the quick marriage then? But here's the thing. Assuming Rhaenyra was pregnant prior to the wedding with Daemon, how do we know that the baby is even Damon's? In order for the pregnancy to cause the wedding, Rhaenyra has to have sex during her fertility period, go through her infertility period, and then miss her menstruation. 
That process takes a few weeks, if not longer. A shotgun wedding actually supposes Rhaenyra was sexually active in mid-March or earlier. So could the baby's father actually be somebody else? And the answer is, well, yeah, it's possible. So we know that Lena dies on the third day of the year, but we have no idea when Lenor dies. It happens when Corlys and Rhaenys are still in mourning, but mourning periods, official or unofficial, are not really set in stone. So yeah, there's a chance Rhaenyra was pregnant from Lenor, and the timeline is even kinder for Harwin Strong. For example, Rhaenyra could have had sex with Lenor or Harwin the day before Lenor died, at the beginning of March, there's a funeral a week later, and then she realizes she's pregnant a week or two after the funeral in late March and gets married to Damon in early April. Rhaenyra then claims the baby is a little early, when it's actually a little late. Yes, it's shocking she gets married only a month after her husband's death, but the maximum time for there to be between Lenor's death and her marriage is only about two months, so there's not much difference. Also, we should note that Rhaenyra is on Dragonstone and can simply wait to send the Raven with the birth announcement to King's Landing later. So really, we have no idea when Rhaenyra gave birth. Here, Mushroom's testimony would be the most accurate as he was on Dragonstone and may know actually when she did give birth. And this ambiguity in Aegon III's parentage is clearly a parallel to Jace's parentage, which we'll get to in the next paragraph. Now, I will say this paragraph does seem a little odd with its timing, as Viserys is angry that the wedding occurs within half a year of the deaths of Lena and Lenor, making it seem like perhaps the wedding happened a bit later. If it was rushed within a month or two, why not say it was a month or two? And the answer to this is, firstly, that George R. R. Martin simply likes the phrase half a year, much more than a few moons, and secondly, Half a year is about the amount of time Viserys waited after the death of Emma Arryn before shopping for a new wife. What he does is appropriate, anything less is inappropriate. And thus that dreadful year 120 AC ended as it begun, with a woman laboring in childbirth. Princess Rhaenyra's pregnancy had a happier outcome than Lady Lena's had. As the year waned, she brought forth a small but robust son, a pale princeling with dark purple eyes and pale silvery hair. She named him Aegon. Prince Daemon had at last a living son of his own blood. And this new prince, unlike his three half-brothers, was plainly a Targaryen. In King's Landing, however, Queen Alicent grew most wroth when she learned the babe had been named Aegon, taking that for a slight against her own son Aegon, which, according to the testimony of Mushroom, it most certainly was. Hereafter, to avoid confusing the two princes, we'll refer to Queen Alicent's son as Aegon the Elder and Princess Rhaenyra's son as Aegon the Younger. And so here we have a clear parallel between Jace and Aegon III. Both children are born late in a year, leading us to figure out an approximate conception time that's smack dab in the middle of a whole slew of important events. With Jace, it's Rhaenyra's betrothal, the rumors about Kristen Cole and Harwin, and her marriage. With Aegon III, it's the death of Laenor, the leaving of Harwin, and her marriage to Daemon. And with both children, Gildane gives us a physical description and his clear opinion to influence the reader's beliefs. But the striking thing is, with both children, it's absolutely unclear who the father is. We have stories of Rhaenyra being romantic with multiple men within a compressed period of time, and yet we have Gildane's declaration that in one case, the child is a bastard, and in the other, it's trueborn. And this exercise does show how susceptible the human mind is to rumors and falsehoods when they're repeated over and over again. The evidence of Jace being a bastard is relatively weak and has always been weak. But after being repeated over and over again by Gildane, it begins to be taken seriously. Meanwhile, Aegon III's parentage is not questioned at all. And what's interesting is that, logically speaking, it absolutely should be. For example, say you're in the camp that Jace, Luke, and Joffrey are Harwin Strongs, that you believe Mushroom's rumor. This means that Rhaenyra was romantically involved with Harwin for years. And so, logically speaking, if Rhaenyra was romantically involved with Harwin for years, in March of 120, wouldn't it be most likely that she was having sex with Harwin Strong? Aegon III should absolutely be considered Harwin's child as well. 
Or alternatively, say you side with Septon Eustace, and you believe that Jace, Luke, and Joffrey are trueborn. This means that Rhaenyra was doing her wifely duties and trying to have children, whether she liked Laenor or not. So, logically speaking, if Rhaenyra was married and having sex with her husband for years, trying to produce kids, in March of 120, wouldn't it be most likely that she was having sex with Laenor? Jumping into a sudden extramarital sexual relationship with Daemon doesn't really fit either Septon Eustace or Mushroom's narratives. But of course, the central point driving Gildane's discussion on who's a bastard and who's not is the looks of babies. So let's return to that. Here we are told that Aegon III is small with purple eyes and pale silvery hair. Of course, babies come in all sizes, and we have no idea Laenor or Daemon's size. But of course, the size is really only given to contrast Jace, who Gildane pushes is Harwin Strong's. And while Laenor has silver hair and purple eyes, we are actually never told Damon's physical description, just as we're never told Harwin Strong's. Yes, Damon probably has silver hair, but Harwin's ancestor Lucamor Strong was a blonde, which isn't too far off from white. It may be that all three possible fathers had hair that was similar to Aegon III. But these descriptions of Aegon III are kind of pointless as Rhaenyra is his mother, and he could have gotten his features from her or one of her ancestors. There of course would be a certain irony if Aegon III were a bastard and Jace were trueborn, as a huge argument for the Dance of the Dragons centers on Jace's purported bastardy. And in the end, Aegon III does eventually become king. Now it's rather interesting that Gildane mentions that Daemon at last had a living son, as if this was a specific goal of his. He had two daughters and now a son, which he names Aegon, echoing the name of the Conqueror and the three-headed dragon sigil of the Targaryen family, making us think of the three heads of the dragon prophecy. Later this echo goes the other way when Daemon and Rhaenyra try to have a child named Visenya, their purported third child. We should remember that in A Clash of Kings, we are specifically told that the three heads of the Targaryen dragon are for Aegon and his sisters, and Rhaegar seemed to be naming his children for them while being interested simultaneously in fulfilling the Prince That Was Promised prophecy and the three heads of the dragon prophecy. Now it's uncertain if Daemon was aware of the Prince That Was Promised prophecy that Rhaegar was interested in. Targaryen names are reused all the time, and we have no idea if Daemon thought Aegon was special in some sort of destiny sense. The name Aegon, after all, was also the name of Daemon's brother, who died shortly after his mother died of pregnancy complications. Daemon could have just been naming Aegon III for that Aegon, rather than the Conqueror or some savior of the world. However, the idea that Aegon III was named as a slight to Queen Alicent's Aegon II is almost certainly wrong. Whether Aegon III was named for the Conqueror, a savior, or in memory of Daemon's dead brother, the name Aegon is quite revered, and would not have been bestowed for such a petty reason. Now regarding the prophecy, we should note that Daemon and Rhaenyra were more protective of Aegon III and their other child Viserys II, and tried to send them to Essos for safekeeping. And it is notable that Aegon III is born near the end of the year. That is, near Christmas. The birthday of our world's most famous savior. And Aegon III is much like Rhaegar in that he's a depressed individual though Aegon III did experience quite a bit of trauma leading to that persona. Anyway, the birth of Aegon III does bring to a close the Year of the Red Spring, which, again, is supposedly the year where tensions came to a boil and the seeds began sprouting. However, that doesn't really appear to be the case at all. Lena's death seemed to be from natural causes, Laenor's the result of a gambling dispute, Aemon's eye was a fight between very young children, and Harwin and Lionel's deaths from an accidental fire. Even if one were going to claim murder in the situations of Laenor and Harwin, those murders wouldn't be related to the tensions of the story. That is, the tensions between the Blacks and the Greens, between Alicent and Rhaenyra, between the Valarians and the Hightowers. Remember, the accusations with regard to Laenor's death was a lover's dispute or against Daemon, and the accusations with Harwin's death was against Corlys, Daemon, Laris, and Viserys. None of those have anything to do with the political problems stemming from Rhaenys being passed over or Rhaenyra being heir over Aegon. The sole event that one could argue is related to political tensions is the fight between the Valarian boys and Aemond, the so-called rivalry of Rhaenyra's sons and Alicent's sons. 
though in this situation, one of the parties is composed of children six and under, who are unlikely to understand any of this. At the end of the day, while the Year of the Red Spring did have a large effect on the Dance of the Dragons, it didn't really come from long simmering political tensions set up by the rest of the story. It had remarkably little to do with blacks versus greens. By all rights, the year 122 AC should have been a joyous one for House Targaryen. Princess Rhaenyra took to the birthing bed once more, and gave her uncle Daemon a second son, named Viserys, after his grandsire. The child was smaller and less robust than his brother Aegon and his Valarian half-brothers, but proved to be a most precocious child. Though somewhat ominously, the dragon's egg placed in his cradle never hatched. The greens took that for an ill omen, and were not shy about saying as much. And so next we jump to the year 122, and time in the story really begins to blur by. Again, it's rather apparent that George R. R. Martin was trying to finish the Rogue Prince at this point, and there is definitely a noticeable speed change. Viserys' reign covered 27 years, from 103 to 129. The first third of his reign, that is from 103 to 111, takes about 16 pages. And the second third, from 112 to 120, is about 15 pages. And then, quite suddenly, there is a drop. The final third of Viserys' reign is only five pages. Anyway, Viserys II is birthed in this paragraph, with Gildane noting that the boy was small but intelligent. And there is a rather ridiculous line about what an ill omen it was that his dragon egg didn't hatch. This action seems to have made the year not joyous for some reason, which makes little sense. So, the majority of Targaryens don't hatch their cradle eggs. In fact, Daemon's egg didn't hatch, Viserys I's egg didn't hatch, Rhaenys's egg didn't hatch, Lena's egg didn't hatch, and a number of earlier Targaryens. But most notably, at least two of Alicent's children's eggs didn't hatch, those of Helena and Aemond. The Greens judging Viserys II's egg as an ill omen is rather odd as it's a fairly common occurrence. One can say that the Greens are going to gossip when they can, but it doesn't explain why Gildane would claim that the entire year was ruined. Viserys II can simply claim a different hatchling on Dragonstone, or try to claim Vermithor or Silverwing. Having the year ruined by an egg that doesn't hatch doesn't make much sense. Later that same year, King's Landing celebrated a wedding as well. Following the ancient tradition of House Targaryen, King Viserys wed his son Aegon the Elder, to his daughter Helena. The groom was 15 years of age, a lazy and somewhat sulky boy, Septon Eustace tells us, but possessed of more than healthy appetites. A glutton at table, given to swilling ale and strong wine and pinching and fondling any serving girl who strayed within his reach, the bride his sister was but 13. Though plumper and less striking than most Targaryens, Helena was a pleasant, happy girl, and all agreed she would make a fine mother. And so next we hear about the marriage of Aegon II and Helena, which, I have to say, is an odd betrothal. Marrying Aegon to Helena ruins potential alliance making for the Greens. For example, marrying Aegon to Jane Arryn of the Vale, or Helena to Cregan Stark of the North, would have likely secured the Seven Kingdoms for Aegon II. But instead, Aegon and Helena are married to each other, wasting the opportunity. And so because of this, it's hard to believe that Alicent or Otto would have suggested such a match. In fact, the marriage is done a bit early for both of them. Rhaenyra wasn't married until 17, yet Aegon is getting married at 15 and Helena at 13. What's the rush? What's the political emergency? And no, Helena wasn't pregnant. And while this marriage certainly could just be a poorly thought out plot contrivance, it could also be Viserys' idea. Now, I have to say, Viserys himself was rather uninterested in the Targaryen tradition of kin marriage. He chose to marry Alicent, and was seriously considering a number of non-Valyrians for Rhaenyra to marry. However, he was also interested in Rhaenyra succeeding him, not Aegon. And so Viserys himself may have been sabotaging Aegon's ability to form alliances with the move. It's simply surprising that we don't hear about any pushback from Alicent or the small council. There probably would have been. And some may wonder why Otto and Alicent Hightower, who are heavily connected to the Faith of the Seven, would allow an incest marriage, something forbidden in the Seven-Pointed Star. And while the answer may be something simple, like they secretly wanted dragon-riding descendants, 
It may also relate to the doctrine of exceptionalism. During the reign of Jaehaerys, a high septon Alfin and his successor, a high tower high septon, made it okay that Targaryens married each other. And so, considering it was the Hightower family itself that signed off on Targaryen incest, it would be hard for Otto and Alicent to protest it. Now, in this paragraph, we also hear about the personalities of Aegon and Helena. Helena is simply plump and pleasant. She's not much of a character in this story. Aegon II, on the other hand, is a drunk, a glutton, and a sexual abuser, at least according to Septon Eustace. Now, I will say that Septon Eustace has a very interesting relationship with Aegon, as does Mushroom with Rhaenyra. Eustace fairly consistently trashes Aegon throughout the story, which is a bit surprising as Aegon was half Hightower, and Eustace does his best to speak well of the Hightowers. However, while he portrays Aegon as an angry, drunk womanizer, Eustace also is the one who anointed Aegon, and supposed that Aegon wished to pray for forgiveness near the end of his life, even though Aegon didn't say anything of the sort. It seems that Eustace perhaps cared for and pitied Aegon II. Despite Aegon being a wreck, Eustace did still see the boy grow up and experience a number of tragedies. And this is a good place to stop. We'll continue on with Aegon's children and Vaemon's petition in part 25. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.